So Dr. Christopher Mathias um, is presenting on autonomic dysfunctions in Parkinson's. Uh, he was a professor of neurovascular medicine in the University of London. So you're going to hear this wonderful accent as he talks to you. With an appointment held jointly between Imperial College London and the Institute of Neurology, University College of London. He's been the Emeritus Professor at University College London since 2014, an Honorary Consultant Physician at St. Mary's Hospital since 1982, and at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery, Queen's Square, since 1985. He has more than 400 publications in medical and scientific journals on the autonomic nervous system covering neurology, cardiovascular, basic sciences, and internal medicine. He consults at the Hospital of St. John and St. Elizabeth in St. John's Wood, London. Uh, and once again, we are very privileged to have such an expert come and speak to us. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Matthias. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you about a subject which tends to fox a lot of people, not, not just uh, uh, patient groups, but also within the medical profession itself. And I hope uh, over the next 40 plus minutes, I'll give you some idea of the autonomic nervous system, how it works, what are the key components to think of, particularly in Parkinson's disease. But I'm going to focus, because I can't cover, as you'll see in a moment, the entire ground. I'm going to be focusing on one of the problems we know an enormous amount about over the years and which affects people, and quite often people are not aware, both the, the patient themselves, the carer, or even the doctor, in terms of how it's affecting them. So I hope that's going to be you know, the, uh, the, the basis of what I'm going to be saying over the next 40 plus minutes. Uh, before I proceed, I really must thank, I've been very, very fortunate in terms of being in this field, partly by, by accident almost, and by linking up with, with you know, rather brilliant people who, and just a little bit is rubbed off occasionally, as it were, on me. Uh, I'm uh, primarily, I wa am, was in two, in two places where I had the chair. Uh, that's at uh, University College London and Imperial College London, which are two competitors, and people have always wondered how I managed to survive working between two highly competitive uh, universities. And over the last few years, for various reasons, we have built up, and I'll tell you in a moment, to prove that you can actually get autonomic units and get this sort of work and evaluation done in a completely pro uh, separate center without all the massive funding which most university centers provide. Because I think it's a very important point that one can do it outside uh, highly uh, powerful academic centers. So let me begin now. Oh, by the way, it is a bit warm for me over here. Do you mind if I shed my jacket? Or is that going to be? I, I assure you, I will stop there. <laughs> so, I said, we are very casual. Are you okay? Thank you very much. So there's, there's nothing like because because temperature regulation is controlled, by the way, by the autonomic nervous system too. Now, just to let you know, my uh, uh, this this slide is to indicate that with Parkinson's disease, we know all about the motor side because it's visible to, to us both. Uh, the patient, of course, and also the non-patient. It's the non-motor side uh, which has been put into the doldrums for many, many years. And this just gives you an idea that there are many of them. There are psychiatric aspects, there are sleep disorders, there's olfactory dysfunction, and then you've got the autonomic, which is clumped together, and I'll tell you why it's clumped together. There is a separate subgroup, which is a particular problem, and that's cardiovascular autonomic dysfunction, which is what I'll be focusing upon. That's the bit in yellow and red for those who might find it difficult from the back. Now, this is where the difficulty comes in. How do we know what the autonomic nervous system is? Now, does anyone in the audience have even an inkling of what the autonomic nervous system is? Hands up, please. And you won't be asked questions, I'll show you. Now, you, you know a lot about the motor system. Those are the nerves going to the muscles. You know an enormous amount of the sensory system. It takes impulses to the brain. We know about the central bits. That's cognition, our thinking processes. The autonomic nervous system is what supplies every organ in the body. Every organ, I quickly add. You know, from, uh, you know, from the eye, the pupil there, to the heart, to the, uh, to the gut, 
and to all the pelvic organs. And there are two components to it, and they sometimes work in opposite directions. One is called the sympathetic, and it comes down from the spinal cord, and it goes to every organ. And the other is the parasympathetic, that comes from the brain, partly, and that goes to the upper half, as it were, largely of the body, the organs there. And then you've got the lower, the sacral bit, which goes to what we call the pelvic organs, that's concerned with the bladder, bowel, and sexual function. Now, this system, we don't know most of the time what it's doing because it's doing it so effectively. And this is why it's doing it automatically. So just an example, you're not bothered about your heart rate or your blood pressure or what your bladder is doing, unless you want to empty it, of course. So it's doing it all automatically, which is part of the reason why autonomic nervous system came. The problem being, of course, when it goes wrong, it's very difficult to pin it down, particularly over the, the last few years. And just to tell you where the, where the links go, the, I haven't shown the brain here other than the lower part of the brain. There are centers in the upper part of the brain and the lower part in the spinal cord and the nerves going out. So there are an enormous number of areas where they link up, which means there are an enormous number of areas where things can go wrong also. Okay. Now, in Parkinson's disease, it's thought that the problem is dual. It could be within the brain itself. Um, it could also be within the nerves coming down there. There is somebody called Brach, who you may or may not have heard of as a neuropathologist, who's done an enormous amount of work in terms of also trying to track down where it might have arisen. So you can have problems, and this is why you get something like Lewy bodies also within the gut and within the autonomic nervous system. Now, uh, the, this uh, system works automatically, I've said all the time, but it interacts also. So, for instance, one example is I'm standing here without, well, so far, without any problems, as it were, and the reason is because these nerves are keeping my blood pressure up. It's much easier if you're sitting down, and it isn't a problem at all when you're lying down. That's because of gravity, because gravity will pull your blood pressure down while this maintains it. But it's not just that, it's also linked up, as I'll give you examples, with the amount you're drinking, what you're eating, whether you're having a drink of alcohol, and so on. And this is what I'll try and expand over, over the next uh, few minutes. As you can imagine, because it supplies every organ in the body, a whole range of problems could occur. Forgive my busy slides, this is really more of an aid memoir for me, so I can pinpoint things down. It can affect the cardiovascular system and lower blood pressure if it's not working well, sweating, the gut, the bladder, sexual function in the male in particular, and also what Dr. McEwen was talking about in relation to how one's laryngeal cords and so on function too. This usually doesn't matter in terms of the pupil, but your pupil is quite important because when there's a lot of light, your pupil constricts. When it's very dark, it expands. So you can quite see how it's so important in the way we function in a whole range of different situations. I'm going to give you some examples now, but focus largely, as I said, on blood pressure control, because that's important. You're going to ask the question, does anyone know why we need to have a normal level of blood pressure? Who's going to help me with that? Well, we need a normal level of blood pressure, and that magical figure of 120 by 80 is there. And you think it's mainly the heart and what's in, in the blood vessels, but it's the autonomic nerves which keep the blood pressure up. And it's got to be kept up, particularly when one's upright. Because if the blood pressure falls, say in my case, I will not get enough blood going to the brain. Not enough blood, not enough nutrients, not enough oxygen, I'm in huge trouble then. So just as an example, so it's got to supply every organ, by the way. The brain is even more susceptible because it's over the heart. Um, <clears throat> how does it do it? And forgive this slide again. Very simply, there are impulses from the nerves around the heart and blood vessels which go into the brain. And then out from the brain, depending on the pressure, whether it's got to go up or go down, you get the nerves which, for instance, go to the heart and tell the heart to either speed up or slow down. Or it goes to the blood vessels all over the body and tells them to constrict. You know what I mean by constricting? Yep, get smaller so you keep your blood pressure up. Or dilate so your blood pressure 
falls if it's too high. So this is known as the baroreceptor reflex because it's linked up with receptors. How do we test for this? Uh, because this is important in terms of evaluating it. The simplest way is to test the blood pressure, which I'm sure is done by your doctors, when you're lying, ideally sitting also, and standing. So I'm going to ask a question now. How many of you have had your blood pressure checked in the last few months, say, or year? Virtually all of you. How many of you have had your blood pressure checked when you've been lying down? Good. Fewer. How many when you've been sitting up? Majority. How many of you when you've been standing up for about three minutes? Far fewer, but I'm impressed. A few of you have, you see. Usually, it's something in the region of zero, because most people do it when people are sitting down. And standing is really very important, because as I said, that's when the gravity problems come in. So you need, so forgive these, uh, uh, this equipment. It looks daunting, but it isn't, I assure you, because all the equipment we have in our departments now are what we call non-invasive. So you can put things on the fingers, you can stick things on the chest, and you get a whole range of measurements, blood pressure, heart rate, and so on, which tells you what's going on or what's going wrong, for that matter. One of the important things is to actually put people on a tilt table. This isn't torture, by the way, of any sort. <laughs> it's, and it sounds worse. The main reason is safety, because we don't want people to fall in case their blood pressure falls dramatically and damage themselves. So hence the straps around here, you see. Um, uh, this isn't, by the way, a variation of fifth. I believe it's something called Fifty Shades of... <laughs> well, um, now, just to, just to show you an example of, what, uh, of how these things are, are linked, this shows the blood pressure now, which rather than the single measurements which you get, this is continuous with every beat of the heart and non-invasively. So that's the blood pressure before, during the head up, tilt, and after. And that's in a subject whose nerves are working well. There's hardly any change. This is a patient, for instance, who's got autonomic failure and Parkinson's, but the blood pressure, when put up, falls. Can you see the fall there? Quite markedly, but mainly when the person's upright. The moment the person's put back to the horizontal there, the blood pressure goes up and can go up quite high even. That's the other problem which can occur, but we'll keep that uh, uh, under wraps, at least for the moment, as it were. So, you can see the reason why, where things can go wrong if your blood pressure falls dramatically. Just by standing up, by the way. Now, uh, what is important is why is it doing it? Because these nerves are not producing a chemical called noradrenaline. This is produced by the nerves, and it constricts the blood vessels and keeps your blood pressure up. And this is quite important because right at the end, one of the drugs which we could be using, which we should be using, is what is almost a replacement of this. So uh, one way, and this is where it's quite important in the individual patient, and we now advocate, forgive me for using that word, uh, that really all patients are checked. It's good to know that there's no problem, but clearly if there's a problem, to find out. Because we can measure these chemicals in the bloodstream and determine if they're very low or very high. I won't bore you with the rest of this slide, but just to indicate that these are two, a brother and a sister. They didn't have Parkinson's, but they had virtually no noradrenaline in their system. And this is of some importance because it led us onto a drug which we could be using in Parkinson's. We think one of the better ways is also to use machines, little machines, similar to the microphone that I have, with a cuff, and we hope it'll get even better with sophistication. So the, the person can then take it home and there are various tasks we get them to do so that it's while eating, while exercising, while lying flat, sitting and standing. So we get a measure of what the blood pressure is doing in the home situation right through the day, because that's important. At the end of it, it's got to be the individual and what they're doing, because activities vary. Just to give you some, an example of this, that's the upper level of blood pressure, systolic, lower level of blood pressure, and heart rate. This is a subject who does not have uh, uh, an autonomic disorder. There's little change other than when they're up and about, and there's a little drift downwards at night, because if the nerves are working well, they switch off a little bit when we go to sleep. This is a patient who's got autonomic failure. 
Okay? Now look at the blood pressure. It's jumping up and down. And it's up when they're lying flat. It's down when they're standing. Look at it at night when they're in bed. It's much higher. But look at what happens here. And that's because this person has needed to empty their bladder. So they've got out of bed. And in fact, quite a lot of people with autonomic failure tend to need, it's not just age, it could be just the condition that they've got to empty their bladder more often at night. It's known as nocturia at night. And the reason being, when you're lying flat, you produce much more urine because you've got a much better, better blood supply. So there is some logic to that as it were. And you can quite see how susceptible people can be at, uh, at night if they get out of bed. So how useful it can be. So just to give you a few aspects of that, we now recognize, and I'll give you some statistics, that it's a major non-motor feature in PD. Uh, it can be very troublesome, and we'll talk about that. There can be problems, uh, and uh, of importance is that if you understand and, and, and help with the, uh, the low blood pressure, you can actually use far more drugs which will treat the motor side, because most Parkinson's drugs therapy can lower the blood pressure. There's a potential to do that, which many people realize, but tend to, again, put under the carpet. How common is it? It, it can be rare. And you know why it's rare, either very early in the disease or nobody's measuring the blood pressure lying and standing. Or some don't even measure it at all. And then, of course, you miss it. Uh, but in those who have, it can go up to about 60%, of which 40% are symptomatic. This is not our data. This is data from various other major centers. It depends on what age. Clearly, the older you are, you're more susceptible. What stage, knowing that it's a progressive disorder and therefore things can go wrong? Which drugs we talked about, Parkinsonian, anti-Parkinsonian drugs, and so certain of them are more likely to do it? And of course, I just added that in, which doctor you're under? Because if they're interested in the subject, they'll look for it. If they're not, possibly not. Now, now you're going to say, what are the symptoms which occur? Now, the main symptoms are you're not getting enough blood to the organs. We talked about no oxygen or little oxygen and not enough nutrients. And these are some. So when the brain is what we call hypoperfused, you can be dizzy, you can have visual changes, you can pass out, faint. Or some people have something in between. They're not functioning as clearly as they do. So don't hold this against me. Uh, or if, if I'm not answering your questions later as sharply as I should, <laughs> I'll blame it on the blood, low blood pressure. But this we, we have tested formally, so this can happen. Many people get pain in the neck and the what we call the coat hanger region, the neck and the shoulder. Have any of you who are patients had pain at all in the neck and shoulder region? A reason number. Now, I'm going to ask you another question, if you know. Does this pain go away when you're lying flat for a period of time? OK, you said yes, and you said yes too. Because it's linked to the blood pressure. You're not getting enough blood to these muscles here, you see. So most people in the past would pile in the, the non-steroidals, you know, the analgesics and so on. Well, the key is to get the blood pressure up. Um, <clears throat> we talked about the fact that if you're upright, you pass very little urine. And when you're at night, you pass much more. Now, this is really quite important. Um, the majority have what we call non-specific symptoms. They feel weak, tired, lethargic. Uh, there could be many causes for that, but this could be one. Even more serious in any age group, but particularly the elderly, is that they could be, and, and I'm sorry to shock you with these, but these are real patients, as it were. This is a patient who was actually languishing in one of the wards because nobody knew why she was falling. And she was jolly lucky she didn't lose her sight with damage or have an intracranial bleed until one bright nurse took her blood pressure lying and standing, and then the penny dropped. She had severe orthostatic hypertension complicating her condition. It can be more subtle. This is a patient who I saw who was on one of the orthopedic wards who was fully dependent uh, but then fell, fractured, the, uh, the humerus here. I don't know whether you can see it from the back. And this was the dependent arm and then became semi or, you know, markedly uh, less dependent. Uh, sorry, markedly independent, yes. Yeah, so. um, 
And, and so you, it can have quite a profound effect, as it were. And this is because the blood pressure fell and he injured himself. It's worth thinking, it's not, by the way, and forgive another busy slide, but just to make a few points, it's not just standing up which can do it, because certain things which expand the blood vessels in other regions, when we stand, because of dear old Isaac Newton, we are expanding the blood vessels in the feet mainly. But say if you eat or you have a drink of alcohol, you expand the blood vessels in the gut. So that can cause a problem. If you exercise, you can... Uh, cause a problem because you need more blood going to exercising muscle. And I'll give you some examples to show you in real life, as it were, what happens. And there are certain other things, such as hot weather. You're going to say, why hot weather? Because in hot weather, you expand the blood vessels in the skin. And if your nerves are not working well, your blood pressure will fall quite a lot. I'm just going to show... Sorry, you have an example. Oh, sorry, a uh, question. Sorry, so that okay? Continuing cold water. I, I missed that. Cold, 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 cold water. water. You go into cold water. Yeah, that's where you breathe in, yeah. Really, going into cold water, yeah. yeah. Uh, but we don't know whether your blood pressure falls. There could be another reason for that. It shouldn't fall, but you raise a good point because if your nerves are not working well, then the constriction which occurs in cold water is not occurring, so there may be other mechanisms. I'm afraid we haven't subjected any of our patients to cold water dunking as yet. You see. <laughs> I could be in trouble, you know, but you could volunteer. <laughs> but a good point, thank you. Just to show you an example, forgive these slides, but it's good to have a graphic thing. Uh, normally, when you eat food, your blood pressure tends to remain uh, upright. But if you've got autonomic failure, as in this particular patient, soon after eating, the blood pressure falls. And by the way, this is the patient lying flat. Okay, so it's not gravity. So just food is lowering the blood pressure from what was 130 by 80 or 70 down to 90 by, and for quite a long time. Okay, so that's called postprandial hypotension. This is with exercise. And with exercise, normally the blood pressure goes up. And these are people exercising while lying flat. If you uh, uh, have... By the way, this is a condition called MSA uh, and, and PFA, but also in PD. It's not on this slide. The blood pressure does the reverse. It falls. So just the opposite. So exercise, which is so, so very important, could be having an adverse effect. You've got to put that into the equation. And, of course, this is what's called iatrogenic. And I use the word. Do you know what iatrogenic means? It's caused by? The medical profession, you see, <laughs> uh, by the way, but uh, not, not, not purposefully. And this is a patient who, in fact, came up uh, to see me who had very low uh, blood pressure. But if you, as you see here, the patient was on a whole range of drugs, including, by the way, some drugs to prop the blood pressure up. And the, the moment the patient was taken off the drugs, the blood pressure got very much better. We had to reintroduce some others, by the way, but it was to make the point that it was the drugs which were contributing to the problem. Um, now, I'm going to just go very quickly through some of the other systems which are involved and then talk about the treatment of low blood pressure. Now, uh, pseudomotor relates to, to sweating and to temperature regulation, which is very, very important. Most people think of it as heat intolerance because they don't sweat, but in Parkinson's disease, one of the problems can be excessive sweating for reasons which are not entirely clear. Um, and, and just to give you an example, this usually doesn't occur in Parkinson's, uh, where you can be sweating excessively over the hands. What is more frequent uh, is, is sweating all over the body, particularly the trunk. By the way, don't be worried. We haven't flagellated this patient <laughs> as it were. Uh, this is where you use a dye. The dye is, is pale, but the moment it comes into contact with moisture, it turns a vivid red, so you know exactly where the person is sweating. And you can see this excessive sweating which can occur. Can I ask, do you know, you don't have to, do you know of any patient with Parkinson's who's got excessive sweating as a disorder? Yes. And it can be very distressing, as it were. Okay, a few other things. We, uh, Dr. McEwen talked about the gut and both the upper gut and the lower gut, and the mid-gut, by the way, can be involved. Um, and just to give you some ideas also of something you might think as simple as saliva, 
because there can be either excessive saliva, particularly overnight, which can cause problems, and I'll give you an example there. Sometimes it can be too little, usually as a side effect of the drugs. And of course, that can cause problems in terms of speech, in terms of swallowing, and obviously in terms of how one feels. Dr. McEwen, I think, talked about the speech and language therapists, and we use a thing called cine video fluoroscopy, which we find very useful in those who have even early phases of choking. And just to give you an example, normally it should go down what we call the right way. Uh, and in this case, with the swallow there, it's going down in two places, not only down the esophagus, but also down the larynx. And not as severe as in this person. Can you see it right down there? It should be there, but in fact, it's also over there. That's going into the chest. That could be bad news. So it's good to be one step ahead sometimes, if there are symptoms, not if there are no symptoms in terms of pinning this down. And of course, constipation can be a big problem also. Um, uh, the bladder, a whole range of things uh, which can be involved. By the way, I hope you don't mind. This is, not, this is not taking the mickey. Is that a term which is used in Canada too? You, do, you don't use it, is it? You don't, you see. This is, this is not poking fun at anyone, but just as a means of reminding me also as to the problems which occur. There's a whole range of bladder problems. And by the way, the best is to get them to go and see a urologist who knows about the subject. So we do not treat them. We send them to the right physician or surgeon who will deal with them. The same, by the way, in the male in particular. It's the problems with sexual dysfunction, both erectile and ejaculatory. And this is, again, just to remind me that a whole range occurs. And again, it's good to get specialists who would help with that. Because some of the drugs used, for instance, with inducing erection, you've heard of, obviously, of, 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 I should say obviously, but you must have, of Viagra and other things, they dilate the blood vessels. So they can drop the blood pressure quite a lot. So it's good to have both the doctor who knows the subject, so the urologist know about it, but also the other one, and they should link up. So coordination is very important. Uh, we, we, I think we'll leave the other bits, because I think what I want to do now is really talk to you a little bit about how we deal with the problems of treating people who've got orthostatic hypotension. By the way, orthostatic is when you stand up um, and, and drop their blood pressure how important it is in the individual to know what is causing it, hence those tests. Obviously, talking to the patient, examining them, the autonomic testing. So you know, is it food which is doing it? Is it a bit of alcohol? Is it exercise? All these things need to be factored in in the individual, which is so important because I think medicine, not just in, in Parkinson's disease but in others, should be precise and it should be individualized to the individual which matters. Um, it's also important to know the mechanisms and what's doing it because this is not just important for the patient, it's also important for the doctor. I'm sure you want to know what your doctor is thinking when he says we're going to use drug X, Y, or Z, and why. Good question, an important question, and a necessary question. So just to give you some idea, I'm going to take you quickly through the treatment of orthostatic hypertension. Before we reach for our gilded pens, um, which some of us are wont to do, I'm told. The, the, the important thing is to think of what we call the non-drug measures which are used, or the non-pharmacological measures. And getting the balance right is very important. But always start with the non-drug ones, because A, they don't, as a rule, cost any money. B, the side effects are huge, usually pretty well nil. And they are important even if one is using drugs later. So just to give you an example now, what we've got to be doing, the the, uh, gain, the, uh, uh, the goal is to reverse this orthostatic hypertension. So when people are standing or exercising, you're maintaining the blood pressure. You're not getting the blood pressure fall. So how do we do it? Just a few things. Uh, the first is the non-drug me measures, as I said. And simple things, I'm just giving you some examples because this is all in the literature which you can look at. Uh, uh, an example would be, when you get out of bed. How many of you leap out of bed? Uh, you, you do, yes. Now, why, can I ask, why do you leap out of bed? I always have, I guess. 
Yeah, okay. Because many people do that by habit, you see. Even though, I mean, the motor side can make it worse, of course. But if you, if you get out of bed quickly, you're more likely to drop your blood pressure. So something as simple as that, but it's got to be ingrained because most of us over our working lives have been jumping up and getting out of bed and rushing around, you see. So things such as that, things to avoid, such as hot weather, because if you're very hot, you can't avoid hot weather, but keep yourself cool because you're dilating the blood vessels. Things to introduce, simple things such as in the day and phase it out towards the evening, drink plenty of water. So most people think, now can I ask you, how many of you think you drink a liter of water a day? Hands up. How many think they drink more than a liter of water a day? Really, yes, okay. Now that's interesting because the intake of fluid should be about two and a half liters for somebody of normal size. And that's not Coca-Cola, by the way, and cafe, <laughs> too much of coffee. It's got to be mainly for, because otherwise you pee it out, as it were. So it's quite amazing how under uh, uh, volume uh, we are, volumed, if that's the right word, you see. And then the last thing is to consider things which we find do help, one of which is fluid. And I'll just give you an example because this is... Uh, what at the turn of the millennium, this was what emerged. And they said, two glasses of water. And this is why I took this picture in our garden at the time. Uh, because even in London, which I believe has similarity with Vancouver, it, it rains most of the time. <laughs> it can be very dry, as you can see there. But two liters, sorry, two glasses of water can raise the blood pressure up. These are people who've got very low blood pressure where you can't raise the blood pressure with other means. I didn't believe it, really. This was a paper from, from America, from Tennessee. And I thought there must be something in the water supply there which kept the blood pressure up. So for those of you who know there's a river called Thames in London, we didn't use typical Thames water because you never know what you'd catch from it. But we used other things, and we found it was true. In fact, this has uh, prompted me, and I was asked to write an article or an editorial for The Lancet, which is, as you heard, one of the major journals on a 21st century water cure. It used to be used for other reasons in the past, by the way, water cures. There are problems. Uh, there are advantages with water because it doesn't cost anything. At least, you know, I don't know whether bottled water costs you. I suppose some of it does, but otherwise you, but water is pretty well cheap. So there are huge advantages with health service systems which are stretched, possibly not in Canada, Certainly in the UK, you see. But there are disadvantages, because unlike your blister uh, pack uh, proof, or whatever they're called, uh, packaging, you have to carry along water. And this is why I was very struck a few years ago in, in terms of uh, this, you see, having little cans of dehydrated water. You see. <laughs> um, we're still working on it with our colleagues in the engineering side. You see. Um, drugs. Uh, now... There are a whole range of drugs, and again, I'm not going to bore you with them, but just to give you some examples of how they work. One is called a starter drug. This is, uh, this is a steroid, but only a very specific steroid, and all it does is keep the salt and water in and raise your blood pressure with very few side effects. Natural? Sorry? Is it natural? It can be natural. It, this one is synthetic, but your ap very good question. It, in fact, the, the actual substance uh, uh, originated from something called licorice. So licorice tablet, except that you don't know what dose you're taking with that, you see, which is the problem. So, uh, you're, but you're right. A lot of the drugs we use sometimes emerge from traditional and, uh, and herbal and other things. Um, there are drugs, if you've got less noradrenaline, you can use drugs called ephedrine or mydodrine. And I'll give you one example of another drug which replaces the missing thing over there. And again here, I just point out that you can use what I call targeting drugs. So for instance, if people are prone after just a glass of wine or after having a small amount of food, their blood pressure falls because the blood vessels here are dilating, you can use a drug called octreotide or you can use a drug, as we now have noted, called pyridostigmine, which prevents the blood pressure from falling after food. If, for instance, you're passing a lot of urine at night, then they can use a drug called desmopressin, which is taken only at night and it reduces the amount at night so the blood pressure in the morning is much better. This is, by the way, for those who are anemic, and this is why it's so important to check other things too to make quite sure there's no other problem causing the low blood pressure. But what has been very exciting is this drug. 
because we don't have, by the way, are any of you familiar with a condition called hypothyroidism? You are, yeah, I'm sure most of you are. And how do you treat it? You treat it by giving uh, a replacement drug called thyroxin, which is the natural product, which you just take by mouth, which replaces it. It's as straightforward as that. You know, there's nothing fancy about it, and it's very, very effective. Now, you're going to say, why don't we use the natural product? Why don't we give noradrenaline to our patients who've got lower levels of noradrenaline? And the same question was posed in Parkinson's years ago. Why don't we give them dopamine? And the reason is, if you give it by mouth, it's chewed up in the gut. So it, it doesn't work. And you certainly don't want to give it by, you know, by infusions into the veins and so on. But this is when this drug came up, you see. And, and the reason it came up was about 33 decades ago. And I show you, I was younger those days. Not necessarily wiser, but <laughs> um, we had two patients, the ones I pointed out, a brother and a sister, who had a very rare condition where they had no adrenaline and they had no noradrenaline. And in fact, I thought the person who was doing this in my department had got it wrong. And I got them to repeat it three times, but it was zero. And the reason being, they did not have an enzyme called dopamine beta hydroxylase. Now, that converts dopamine into noradrenaline and adrenaline. And my research found that in Japan, they had a drug which they were using for a condition called amyloidosis, and certainly wasn't in the UK at the time, called DOPS, which looked like noradrenaline, but had this hydroxyl group there. And forgive me for boring you with that, but the reason being, if you give this and you can give it by mouth, it's chewed up. Sorry, it's not chewed up. It's, it's uh, acted upon by this enzyme called dopa decarboxylase, which I'm sure you've heard of because it's used in Parkinson's, and it's converted into noradrenaline. So it bypasses the lack of the enzyme. So a very useful thing which could be, and this is where the experience started, certainly in the UK and in Europe on this. Uh, now, it's actually very similar to L-dopa because the same thing is used. It's given with a dopa decarboxylase inhibitor usually, because you don't want too much in the system. That's the blood. You want it going into the brain. And the same with LDOPS. It's acted upon by dopa decarboxylase, and it's converted into noradrenaline. So you've got your replacement drug by giving it by mouth. Now, I'm sure you've got a question to say. If you're using a dopa decarboxylase inhibitor, which is quite often used in Parkinson's, is it going to negate the effect of this drug? And the answer is it doesn't. It can diminish it slightly, but it doesn't negate it, which is really good news because we can use it with the other anti-Parkinsonian drugs, including those with dopa decarboxylase inhibitors. I'm just going to give you some examples to show you that it works, uh, as it were. This is using different doses. This is taken from various studies, which various colleagues and ourselves have been doing over the years in different continents, uh, mainly in Europe and in the United States now. This is the blood pressure which falls when you give placebo. That's the blood pressure which is much higher, thank you, when, when you give the drug. Um, that's in patients with Parkinson's because, of course, you can fall in Parkinson's for other reasons. When you use the uh, placebo, you have a far more falls as compared to when you're using the drug. It, it more than halves it, as it were. And, and the answer is, it is important, because what we want to do is avoid these sort of problems. may not be completely, but we've got to try our best and, and, and do that. And this is where it comes and is very useful. So I'm going to, I'm going to end now, since you know, I've, I've had my warning ticket, as the two are, you see. And I just take this from one of my colleagues, because he did, he did his postgraduate work with me. Uh, his, his name is Professor Chowdhury. And he's one of the key per persons behind the non-motor symptoms being, being actually pushed up the line in Parkinson's disease. And in fact, he has been writing in PD about the use of personalized medicine and precision medicine. So you've got to get the testing and you've got to work on it. So just to summarize, and this is the take-home message, autonomic dysfunction overall is actually quite common. And even orthostatic hypertension, if you measure it in some, uh, uh, can cause problems. It's particularly important that it's recognized. If you don't recognize it, you ain't going to get anywhere with dealing with it. It's important that it's properly investigated. I put this in precisely evaluated because, and 
Again, somebody who say in the active phase, it's going to be different, and this is why you've got to evaluate it in that situation, against somebody who may be in a wheelchair, because then the situation is altered. So you've got to link it up, and of course we come down to the individual, so it's personalized treatment. So this applies very much also to the autonomic side, but on a good science, definitive evidence base. So it's not just your doctor plucking drugs and chucking them, throwing them at you, there's got to be good reason for that. So on that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening. Oh, I'm sorry I put this on. Oh, I should have said that uh, I have a conflict of interest here. I shouldn't have put this slide in. If, if you really want to read up about it, there is a textbook on autonomic failure, which I believe is thought to be very good. It had rave reviews, <laughs> but, but rumor had it, it was for insomnia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. That's, um, we've had a number of questions. We at the Parkinson Society BC run an information and referral service. And we've had a number of questions around this and it's been, we're not clinical, but uh, we do provide education and information. So it's been a, a good, a very good education uh, session. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. We do have um, 15 minutes for Q&A, although I know some of you already asked your questions during the session and that's just fine. Um, but we do have some, so I'm going to turn the microphone over to you, Courtney. Where'd you go? I'm right here. My husband has uh, orthostatic hypotension, and between the uh, urologist and the uh, neurologist, Basically, they've agreed he just will take one of those little packages of salt that you can get on the ferry at the fast food restaurant in the morning after his, before he goes out to do anything. Any comments on that? Yes. I, I, as I said, you know, I didn't go through all the things which yeah. occur, but one of the things to introduce would be plenty of salt. Um, and... Uh, uh, because salt keeps the water in, the fluid in, and keeps the blood pressure up. This is why they say if you've got high blood pressure reduce the salt, but if you've got orthostatic hypertension, increase the salt. Uh, but again, I think to watch it, to increase the salt in the morning, midday, and evening, but not at night, because when people are lying flattish, then the blood pressure tends to go up, so that's the thing. But absolutely right, salt and fluid are the, are the staple, as it, were, as it were, in terms of helping. So just a point of clarification, is POTS what you're talking about? Postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome? No, no, that's very different in is fact. It? Uh, uh, it, it is confusing. The postural tachycardia syndrome is uh, when you get a rise in heart rate when you, are, when, you, when you stand up, hence with posture. But one of the definitions is the blood pressure must not fall. Uh, and this is why it excludes all those who've got orthostatic hypotension. So, for instance, uh, um, uh, and in, in the slide which I showed, I should have pointed that out, the heart rate didn't actually go up, because you're right, in many people, the heart rate tends to go up to try and keep the blood pressure up, but it, it fails. But that's not POTS, because the blood pressure is falling. So it's quite, quite different from POTS. And because also the treatment is... There are similarities, but quite different also. So patients with PD, certainly in my experience, do not get POTS. I hope that clarifies it. I've been having episodes where... Um, Sorry, I can't see. Over here. <laughs> Oh, well, I apologize. I, yes, I couldn't see the mic because of the gentleman's head, you see. I, I thought I was having auditory hallucinations first. Oh, sorry. Um, I've been having um, episodes where um, I, my whole body goes limp and um, my eyes close, I can't speak, but I can hear everything, I'm perfectly conscious. Um, and... Um, they last about half an hour normally, um, unless someone tries to intervene, mm -hmm. in which case, uh, just recently I was in the hospital for eight days because I couldn't come out of it. So is that, would, could that be re related to this? I'm, I'm just gonna, if you don't mind mm. answering one or two questions, does this mainly occur when you're upright? 
um, well, sometimes it's when I've been lying down and I stand up. But the last oh. time it happened, I was lying down. Yeah, but had you been upright or had you eaten a large meal or had you... I you know, had been, been celebrating and had, you no. know, <laughs> a half, half a bottle of champagne or more, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> no, the reason yeah. I'm asking is that uh, there could be the uh, one of the reasons is that you could be lowering your blood pressure, which triggers this off. And you're going to say, shouldn't when you're lying flat your blood pressure come up mm -hmm. and you recover very quickly? But this doesn't happen to all. Some people take much longer to recover, particularly people who've had problems with fainting in the past as youngsters, and that's not an uncommon condition because that triggers off certain things within the brain and the autonomic nervous system. So there could be dual components which is causing you to have the symptoms which you've described because, as you say, you're not completely blacked out. No, I'm, I'm, very, I'm actually hyper alert. Yeah, indeed so. Um, so yes. Noise and, noise and light is re really irritating yeah. to me. And so there could be two components, and the first is to say, is there an orthostatic component? So you need to go to your doctor and get some, some, some what I call proper autonomic tests so that that can be treated readily and then additional ones if needed. Mm, okay, thank you. I think there are some more questions in that. Oh, there's a whole bunch more questions in that, <laughs> in that back area. Then move towards the front uh, When a Parkinson patient uh, does not have a regular uh, blood pressure issue, but would the fluctuation in the blood pressure cause a stroke? Well, uh, a very good question also. Um, uh, the fluctuations in blood pressure are not good news uh, if you've got problems with your blood vessels. So, for instance, if you've got problems with your blood vessels to the brain, that's the carotid, say, because of what's called atheroma, um, or problems with to the... Sorry, that's, that's, uh, sorry that, not a problem with my heart as yet, but it's out of my <laughs> I've got the microphone there, by the way. With the, with the heart, if your coronary arteries are there, then it could be that you're actually right that lowering the blood pressure catastrophically could induce a stroke or a heart attack. But it's dependent upon the fact of what your blood vessels are in the first place. Most people who've got good blood vessels and either thing, it doesn't seem to cause a problem. But Parkinson patient usually age. So it's kind of like when there's a stroke and there's not because of the blood clot in the, in the brain or blood clot in the heart, it's just due to aging then? It's due to? Aging? Age. Well, I mean, they could be having a stroke or a heart attack for a whole range of reasons, which has got nothing to do with the lower level of blood pressure. Um, so I think that's got to be factored in also, you see. But, I, but clearly, if there's a problem with the blood vessels, you're more susceptible to running into problems. In fact, one of the good news I tell patients is if they've had low blood pressure for a long time, is that almost, you can almost say without doing any tests to their heart or to their blood vessels, the carotids, that they've got good blood vessels because they've been able to cope with the low level of pressure. So you can look at the reverse, I believe always in a positive approach if you can. What's your opinion of uh, inversion tables for Parkinson patients? Inversion tables? Inversion tables where you hang upside down uh, by your feet? <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> it's, it's actually designed for spinal decompression. Absolutely right, in fact. And, and I, I had a, a, a patient. This was a patient. Somebody asked me a question. This is a patient with POTS who asked me that because she was doing a variation of yoga uh, where you... I forget the term she used, but they do this while they are literally hanging from the, seas, uh, from the ceiling. Well, it'll help the blood pressure, but you've got to keep in mind that the blood pressure might go very, very high as a result of that being completely, you know, with head down. I'm not sure, I'm just thinking if I was a patient, I wouldn't particularly want that as a form of treatment, but um, I really don't have any, uh, you know, anything against it, but nothing for it if I may, we might say that. But thank you for raising the point, because this has, as I said, been raised in other conditions too. <laughs> I think there was other questions? Question. Oh, right there. Okay. Could you explain just how, like, for swallowing, you showed the slide with the, you know, the, I guess the vocal cords aren't closing properly, but how does that tie in with this hypertension possibility? I don't quite see. <laughs> 
but my apologies if, if, if I gave you the wrong impression. Those were other examples of where the auto, because uh, when there's what we call a gut or a swallowing or a speech problem, uh, uh, it, it could be, I say, non-autonomic, but it could be autonomic also. Uh, and, and this is where the autonomic nerves do have control over some of the laryngeal and, uh, and esophageal muscles. And, and as I think Professor McCune, who I listened to, uh, Dr. McCune pointed out, uh, in, in MSA, for instance, which is where I cut, if you call it, my movement disordered teeth on the autonomic side when I started about three, four decades ago, um, this can be a major problem. But it's the autonomic going to that, you see, which is why I think in Parkinson's disease it could be a combination. It may not be autonomic. Equally well, it could be contributing. But there's another issue also, if I might add, since you asked what is, what is uh, you know, a, 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 a tricky, not a tricky, but an important clinical question, is that when people choke, if you've got low blood pressure or you're prone to it because of autonomic involvement, that can lower your blood pressure even more. So I've had a patient recently who ran into problems because they were being treated with something called CPAP. Have you heard of CPAP? which is used for sleep apnea. But unfortunately, the pressure was much higher in the chest. And this caused the blood pressure to fall for a very long period of time with unfortunately nasty, well, partially nasty sequelae. So all these need to be factored in. Um, so coming back to that, the gut is involved. And this is why one's got to go to a gut specialist, ideally. But the autonomic nerves play a very important role in terms of function of the gut, both at the upper end what, saliva to begin with? The larynx there, clearly further down there, and the lower gut in terms of constipation. Um, so uh, I hope that partly answers it. Um, are uh, PD patients more prone to heart problems? To, sorry, to? Are they more, more prone to heart problems, PD patients? Um, good, uh, good, I don't particularly think they are, in fact. Uh, but I quickly add, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm going through my little mind is whether I can think of any paper which has actually looked at this in a large cohort. Uh, certainly in the ones who I see, and I don't see them primarily to treat PD, I treat them in terms of the autonomic side. This doesn't seem to be an issue. Equally well, it could be that the ones with low blood pressure who are sent to me to treat are the ones who do not have a problem with the heart, because otherwise they may have been carried away. Does that make sense? If they had bad coronary vessels in the first place. But a very good question. I think it, uh, it, maybe somebody could Google it and find the answer. <laughs> What in PD, you mean? I'm not, I'm not aware of that. I mean, it's well documented in terms of, I think it's called Tatsukoba or whatever. There's, there's a Japanese term for it, uh, where you, you have this hypertrophy and therefore you can't fill. It's not been a problem, certainly in the patients we, we have seen. And as far as I know, many of them have actually had also echoes, so they'd have picked it up. Um, so it doesn't seem to be uh, uh, the case. Equally well, it's well known in those who are, say, you know, marathon runners and cyclists and so on. But I guess by the time, you know, they're, they're in the moderate uh, PD and so on, they're, they're not exercising that much, so it regresses. So can't see a, a direct relationship, but a good question. Oh, so we got to run one more time. <laughs> yeah. Do you want me to run? We'll oh, squeeze gosh. it in. <laughs> no, no, I, got, I think we're going over here. Is it hard to diagnose this if you, if you have white coat syndrome? Uh, uh, well, a <laughs> very good question, in fact. This, uh, uh, well, white coat syndrome, this is on the basis that doctors and nurses wear white coats and they terrify patients as a rule. And that can elevate the blood pressure. And this is why, in fact, this is a very interesting study done by, uh, by one of the professors of medicine of high blood pressure, by the way, because in the UK they found uh, that when they just checked the blood pressure in the, in the GP, you call them GPs here yeah. too, uh, the primary care, uh, that 
quite often, even though they were very diligent, doing it twice or thrice, uh, they found that when they used the machines which we use, which measures it at home, that the number of people who needed medication for high blood pressure dropped by one third. Now that's an enormous amount, A, in terms of the patients, B, in terms of the finances, and so on, you see. It's true, it might have been that group in particular, but it was a, sub which is why the UK government then provided something like 20 million pounds to buy these machines to be used in practice. They wouldn't have, you know, once had to squeeze these things out of them. So coming to your question uh, on that, that white coat uh, syndrome applies for high blood pressure. So it doesn't apply for low blood pressure. I'm not, uh, I mean, it could be that sometimes we frighten our patients <laughs> to the extent that they drop their pressure. <laughs> but we haven't picked it up, or we're not revealing it if we do. <laughs> yeah, what, what would be the reason for both my feet being swollen lately, in the last couple of months? Oh, <laughs> um, there could be a number of reasons going from... Um, you know, from the fact that, uh, if I'm not going to be frightening you, your heart not working too well, so you've got what we call mild heart failure, so you've got that. Some people, by the way, with autonomic problems get swelling of the feet, particularly in hot weather, because the blood vessels aren't coping or by the, the nerves uh, as well as they should be. So there can be a number of reasons for that. Or it could be even drugs. Some of the drugs which are being used dilate the blood vessels even more. We were talking since, since white coat hypertension came, there is a certain drug used for high blood pressure called amlodipine or nifedipine, which again can be used, and that can cause swelling of the, of the feet. So many reasons for that, or many possible reasons, let's put it that way. So, so no immediate answer, I'm afraid. <laughs> Well, I, I think it will be very useful for your, your doctor to just check the heart, to make absolutely sure, as part of a general thing, because that's what I do. I think it's so important to check people you know, broadly, as it were, to make quite sure you're not missing anything else, and then focus on the, on the key problem. It, it, it's, it's possible, uh, but this is where I think you need to be checked. Okay, so I'm going to call things to a close. Uh, we've grilled Dr. Matthias here, I think, uh, quite adequately, particularly since he is uh, suffering from jet lag. So thank you again for a very informative presentation. Thank you.